This is The Wall Street Skinny, a podcast devoted to exploring the financial services industry and making the world of Wall Street accessible to everyone. Hey guys, welcome back to The Wall Street Skinny. I'm Jen. I've got Kristen here. We are, Hi, everyone. <laughs> we are your guides through the world of quantitative trading today. Uh, but before we get to that, Kristen, have you been watching the show Jury Duty? No, but I've heard about it and I don't know okay. why. Well, I think it's actually like somewhat relevant to our topic today, although this is going to be a stretch. I promise I'm not giving away any spoilers. But Jury Duty is like our generation's first foray into like really messing with the Truman Show in Mm -hmm. real life. So the premise of jury duty is that they are doing a reality TV behind the scenes look into the inner workings of a jury during an actual trial. Mm -hmm. Because obviously, you know, juries are, it's a, it's a closed confidential system, right? You're not supposed to know what the deliberations are like or what's said in that Mm -hmm. room. And so the premise of the show is that somehow these producers got access to film this documentary about the jurors. But Mm. what's actually happening is that every single person on the show, the person on trial, the judge, the attorneys, and every single juror except for one is an actor. So there's Mm. one guy and he doesn't realize that it's a reality show about him. He (laughs) thinks he's participating. So it basically sounds like the Truman show. Show. It is the Truman show. Got it. And I've watched the first couple of episodes. It gets a little, I mean, it goes a little off the wall, Mm -hmm. but it's hysterically funny and it raises a ton of like ethical questions, right? Like what did they tell this guy? Well, No, it's funny because, I mean, I was telling you how I went to see Oppenheimer yesterday and they, I mean, I've heard so many people compare kind of what's going on in AI with what was happening in the 40s. And you had these people who were coming up with this stuff that was just obviously like going to change the entire world, which is sort of how it feels like AI is. Mm -hmm. And the other day, India landed someone on the South Pole of the Moon. Mm -hmm. And Mosh, for those of you guys who haven't listened to some of our past episodes, we had him on and he is a news guy and he has this really amazing Instagram account. And so, you know, someone replied to them, we're like, look, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but how is it that we were, we landed someone on the moon in like the 60s and it hasn't really been done since. And he was like, well, back then we spent a lot more money on that. And people were a little more, they were willing to take a little bit more risk. And that's what in Oppenheimer is like the same thing. I think there's so many ethical and important questions that you're bringing up about what humanity Mm -hmm. looks like when it's on the precipice of either a big technological jump forward yeah, Yeah, or a big sociological jump forward or both. And I think right now it feels like we're at the precipice of something transformational with the role of AI in our jobs, yes. in our day-to-day lives, how much yeah. information it's getting about us, what we're comfortable and with. there is a question that we ask our guest who we'll introduce in a second, Harry, just about some of the workings of AI. And he gives us this kind of really scary answer. But- about AI is scary. I mean, you read yeah. these hallucinations. Wait, what? Yeah, the AI has hallucination. I'm actually like I haven't heard this and it sounds terrifying. So wait, yeah. what? <laughs> Where it's making stuff up that isn't real and doesn't exist and like can't exist. So. Okay, Jen, like I'm like seriously like this is terrifying. Think about it this way too. We talked about not being a conspiracy theorist. I actually saw like a stand-up comedy routine on Instagram and it was like, okay, fine, I'm not a conspiracy theorist either. But people who say they don't believe in any conspiracies, the guy was Mm -hmm. like, listen, I'm not a politician. I'm not governing anyone. I'm a parent of one child. Right. And I lie to him about everything. (laughs) (laughs) So it's just funny because there's so much public information out there about what's happening in AI and what's happening Mm -hmm. on all these developments. How much of the picture do you think we really know? But I think the problem is that a lot of the people don't know. The people developing the technology don't know it. Exactly. And the moral of the story is that they they basically were like, when we push this button, there is a non-zero chance that we could basically destroy the world. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, you're okay. setting off an atomic chain reaction. Right, and you're right. like, hope it And they're stops. like, we, exactly. And so that was the whole thing was that yeah. they literally were like, based on the theory, we think it's a 
very low chance. And but, like, it's like, but it's not zero. Into a black hole? Like, who True. Knows? Oh, there's a chance we might destroy the universe, but it's small. And so, yeah, we'll press this button because it's a low chance. I mean, the universe was ending anyways. I mean, yeah. World War II wasn't going yeah. so well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think it's like as we get these crazy ba- breakthroughs with technology mm-hmm. and we don't know where it's going, you don't know what you don't know. And we need and a that- whole new ethical, legal, and scientific mm-hmm. framework through which yeah. to evaluate things going forward. You know, I think we touch on it. Well, what's the role of chat GPT in writing college papers when professors can't tell the difference between the two? Right. Um, Or even one theme that we get a lot of questions about is, hey, I'm looking at entering the job market. And this applies Mm. well beyond the financial services industry. This is, this has long since been an issue and has been an issue since man continues to invent efficiencies, Mm -hmm. right? But especially in the past five to 10 years, as technology really accelerates at this asymptotic rate, how do you navigate entering into the tech industry? And how Mm -hmm. do you navigate entering into the financial services industry in a world where I think people read one or two articles and they're like, oh, everyone's just going to be replaced by an algo. Why do you need humans? It's still very much up for debate and we don't have all the answers. The, The conclusion that we come to some extent is that It's not about you versus the machines yet, at least. (laughs) I am an avid proponent of the Terminator theory. But right now it's about who can master the use of the machines to improve themselves, to augment their own skills. Those are the people who are going to rise to the top the fastest in the current competitive job environment. But so to get into it, our amazing guest today is a man named Harry Mamaisky. And Harry is currently a professor at Columbia University. He got his PhD at MIT, also taught at Yale, and realized in the course of his academic career that everything he was teaching, he had no practical knowledge of. He Mm -hmm. had no applied experience in actually trading. So he worked with Yale. They allowed him to go trade, went to Old Lane. Then he traded at Citigroup with some of the biggest names in the financial services industry. Vikram Pandit, who went on to be the CEO of Citigroup, was a prop trader there and stayed with that team pretty much throughout the beginning of his career and now runs his own quant trading fund. Not a hedge fund, by the way, and we'll get into that, Mm -hmm. but he's going to talk to us today about the role of quantitative trading in the financial services industry, what it takes to get a job as a quant or as Mm -hmm. someone who would be a fit at one of those funds, Mm -hmm. and what kind of the role is of AI in this, you know, brave new world of market technology. Right. All right. Awesome. Let's get going here. We're joined today by our guest. Harry, thank you so much for joining us today. We're so excited that you're here with us. And so what we would love for you to touch on is basically what you're doing now as a professor at Columbia, as well as um, starting your own quant fund. What I do at Columbia are the usual professor things. So I teach an hour MBA program. I teach an hour PhD program. I actually run our Master of Science in Financial Economics program. So I'm the faculty director. It's so nice being at Columbia because they're such brilliant people to work with. And a lot of the research that I do focuses on using big data techniques. Now people will call it like AI and apply these things to to text and try to figure out, can we extract information from text Mm -hmm. and sort of figure out what the text, that information, what it contains and how markets react to it. Mm -hmm. My research is really focused on applying natural language processing techniques to text, extracting information, and then thinking how markets react to that information. And in fact, I actually Last term, I taught a course on this very topic that that I developed that sort of reflects my research interests. Mm -hmm. And the reason I was so interested in that question is because when I worked in my investing job as Uh a prop trader, trading credit, you know, quantitative credit, all sorts of things, which we can talk about, then the Volcker rule came along. And even Mm -hmm. though we had done perfectly well, you know, all the prop businesses were shut down. And then for two years, I ran a group called the Systemic Risk Group. And I was reporting to Brian Leach, who was our chief risk officer at the time. And the idea behind the group was like to create analytics to monitor the macro economy and to really understand what things are happening in the world that could adversely affect Citigroup. So, you know, we'd avoid the sort of things that happened during the global financial crisis. And, and very graciously, they put me on the risk executive committee of, of Citigroup, which mm-hmm. was a you know, huge honor to this day. I'm very honored to have been on it. I wrote code and, you know, we had our algorithms and and the models made suggestions, but I must say that 
I spent 90% of my time reading. Like that's, that's what I did. I read research mm. reports. I read 10 Ks and Qs. I read news articles, you know, on Bloomberg and the FT and mm -hmm. in the Wall Street Journal, Barron's. That's yeah. how I got information. And then it occurred to me as I saw what was going on in technology and analytics and open source code and all that entire universe of stuff about 10 years ago, it just occurred to me the way we invest is going to fundamentally change. The regime of having humans sit there and read, read, read will never go away. But like we can make people much more efficient at doing that. We can mm -hmm. have computers automate part of that process. I listened to countless earnings calls. Why? Because mm -hmm. we were invested in companies and what was said in the earnings calls impacted our investments. Mm -hmm. And in a given earnings call that lasts an hour and a half, there may be like five or 10 minutes of stuff relevant to what I care about. And there was a lot of stuff that had no There's relevance to me. Yeah. Exactly. And so wouldn't it be great if you could ask a machine, just identify for me the five or 10 minutes in this call that I should actually pay attention to and maybe even better yet, summarize what was said. And then if I want to hear it, I can go click on it and, and listen to what was said. But this way I can sort of digest information from 30 calls or 50 calls. Right. Whereas if I had to listen to all of it, I could only listen to five or 10 calls. And I knew that I have strong computer science skills because that's mm -hmm. what I studied as an undergraduate master's. And I thought, wow, like I traded the stuff. I know I read a lot and there's all this stuff going on with people trying to automate understanding mm -hmm. of the information from text. So that's what my research is focused on. So I teach, I do research. And then my firm, which I started two and a half years ago called Quant Street, mm -hmm. reflects the internal struggle I have of, I want to do both academic work and practical work. Uh -huh. I tried to get it out of my head, but when I was a pure academic, I wanted to do industry. When I was in industry, I wanted to go back to academia. And mm -hmm. it seems like the solution for me is to try to do both. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the firm. We do quantitative asset allocation. So we're not a hedge fund. We are an investment manager. We, we manage separately managed accounts for folks. And we also do wealth advisory businesses. And we also have a business that where we work with other institutions to help them uh, on the investing side. And a lot of it uses the same sort of tools that I used as a trader that I use in my research to think about how do we intelligently allocate across different asset classes. It's wow. a really stupid question that maybe none of our listeners are wondering, but that I feel like I am. What differentiates you as an investment manager from a hedge fund? So that's a great question, actually. In terms of the analytics that we use, not mm -hmm. much differentiates us from a hedge fund. We use the same algorithms, we use the same data sets, where we try to understand relative value between asset classes. Mm -hmm. I think the difference is in how we trade those ideas and in how we risk manage the positions. Mm -hmm. So if I was doing at a hedge fund, what I do now with Quant Street, let's say the trade was, our model says, okay, I like high yield bonds a lot and I don't like mm -hmm. investment grade. Like that's my relative value view. Yep. So we had those kinds of trades when I was working at Old Lane and Citigroup. What we would do is we'd probably do a trade in like the credit default swap market using like mm -hmm. credit default swap indices. We'd go long, you know, high yield index. We'd go short an investment grade index. We'd figure out the right ratio. We'd, it'd probably be like, I don't know, 100 million high yield, 300 million IG. And it'd be like a long short position focused only on that one dimension of risk. Like how does mm -hmm. high yield do versus investment grade? Yep. We don't do anything like that at Quant Street, right? We don't take leverage. We don't do short selling. What we would do is we'd say, okay, our typical portfolio would allocate, I'm sort of making up numbers, like 3% yeah, yeah. to high yield, 10% to investment grade. But now we have this relative value view. So the way we're going to change our portfolio is we're going to go to 4.5% high yield, 8.5% IG. You know, we're just going to do you a relative value. You underweight, but you right. still maintain some allocation to each of those asset classes. Right. We maintain allocation. We're not going to do a levered bet. The day-to-day -day driver of our portfolio P&L you know, profit and loss is still going mm -hmm. to be market-wide fluctuations because we never hedge that out. We're exposed yeah. to that. But at the margin, we're going to go a little bit long high yield, a little bit underweight investment. So it. it's kind of the same tools and the same idea, except the implementation is going to be different. Like we are mm -hmm. running a long only book. So we mm -hmm. underweight and overweight. We don't take excessive positions because we kind of understand, look, we're investing for people's retirement savings and we're not going to do anything crazy. But at the margin, we can make these kind of decisions. Whereas if I was at a hedge fund, I would only focus on that one margin, high yield versus IG. It'd right. be a big bet. 
I'd probably watch it 10 times a day um, <laughs> and we'd risk manage it very tightly. So it's similar idea, similar technology to get the idea, similar analytics, similar data, but the risk management and implementation of the trades are very, very different. So that's how that's it That's an happens. excellent it's explanation. Different. Thank you so much. And I'm and- actually curious, what made you decide to go from where you were making those types of bets and you were actually a trader to focusing more on like the investment management side? Like what made you decide to do that type of a asset management firm versus more of like a hedge fund type firm? So that's a great question. What ended up happening is at some point, I made some money and some savings and I needed to invest my own money. And my parents would ask me for advice and my brother and like other people. And I would sort of tell people, oh, I I like high yield to go back to our example or whatever. But like, (laughs) I didn't have an actual answer for them. And I thought to myself, look, I'm like a finance professor and we teach people how to do mean variance optimization and how to do forecasting and how to do all these things. And I'm not actually doing that for my own investments. Mm -hmm. I'm just really investing the way any kind of person conversant in finance would invest. I'm not doing anything remarkable. And so Mm -hmm. how do I combine what I love doing on the research side? You know, I actually love coding. How do I Mm -hmm. give myself a chance to write code and analyze data with actually doing something beneficial for my own investment Mm -hmm. uh, and my family's investments? And the idea was, well, why not start a business that allows me to do intelligent asset allocation that I can use for myself and for my family using the tools that I know very well, using the research that I've done and using my brain in a way that I like to use my brain for thinking about investments. And so that was the genesis of Quant Street. So it's a firm Mm -hmm. I started with my brother, uh, Isaac, who's a lawyer by training. And I took convince him. I said, Isaac, let's do this. Let's do this. And at at some point he kind of, he's my younger brother. So I have a lot of moral (laughs) suasion. So at some point he kind of got sick of saying no to his older brother. And he said, okay, I'll do it. So we, you know, very much viewed it as a family business we do together. That was part of the attraction for me is to be able to work with my brother. But it also so sounds like that, it's more that was aligned with your personal risk tolerance. If you want to be an academic and you don't want to be watching that IG high yield position right. all day long, 40 times a day, it sounds like it's a different risk parameter. It's different risk parameters. It's lower frequency. When we used to trade, I would get 10 calls a day from our sales coverage and they would have all these that ideas. And it was just, <laughs> and you know, and you had to do these things because that's what your job yeah. was. That's not really what I want to do right now. The other problem I tried to solve, and I, I'm not sure what this behavioral bias is called, but when you work in a trading group, you have this feeling like, I have to trade. I have to do something. And if it's like a few days have passed and you haven't traded, you're like, what am I doing? And frankly, a lot of the trades you do in response to that internal feeling of, I have to do a trade, are like stupid trades. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> because yeah. Because when you have a good trade idea, you know about it. You feel it. It's not it's hiding a, somewhere looking to be found. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very primal instinct. You just yeah. know that this is an opportunity and you don't need to look for it. But I spent a lot of time just putting on trades because I needed to show people I was doing stuff. And frankly, I don't have that problem today. When I have an idea that's relevant, I do that idea. Our general allocation strategy is very systematic. Mm -hmm. Um, We trade typically once a month and I never feel the desire to like, I have to trade. I have to think about the world. The other thing to mention, you at some point said like, this is more in line with my own risk tolerance, which is true. Mm -hmm. But the way we've structured our business is we have two layers in our process. The first layer called idea generation, where we use our models and machine learning models and they take inputs from various data sets and they come up with a forecast, a return forecast for every asset class. Mm-hmm. In the second stage of the process, we take those forecasts and we put a lot of constraints around what our model is allowed to do. For example, we'd never have 100% of our assets invested in real estate investment trusts. Mm-hmm. We may like it a lot, but it clearly can't be the majority of anyone's asset allocation. Uh-huh. So we have a lot of constraints. And one of those constraints is we ask our clients through a dialogue that we have with them, What's your risk tolerance? Yep. We get at that through a very effective tool to communicate risk tolerance is to show people the drawdowns. The drawdown being, if I have $100 invested, how much can I lose in an all-stock portfolio in like an 0809 when it lost 50%? Mm-hmm. And so people will say, oh, I want to be aggressive. I want to be all in stocks. Okay, that's fine. So let's take a look at the picture. If you had you know $100,000 invested all in stocks, and this was money you saved over the course of five years, 10 years, from 08 to 09, you would have lost $50,000. Mm-hmm. Now, it came back, but can you tell me that by- Do you have the stomach you know, for that? March of 09, you're not going to call me and say, sell everything. Mm-hmm. Because if you're going to make that call, you shouldn't be invested all in stocks. Mm-hmm. And then you show people what a 60-40 portfolio did, 
which actually was remarkably better because bonds massively rallied during the global mm-hmm. financial crisis. And they say, oh, wow, th- that drawdown was so much better. You know, for me, I'm just more comfortable being in like 60% stock, 40% bond risk instead of a 100% stock, zero bonds. So we sort of get at it through examples and through talking about drawdowns and risk tolerance. And then we can customize for every client a portfolio mm-hmm. that uses our set of model forecasts, but for their risk level. So we have a suite of portfolios, you know, like 50-50 risk, 60-40, 80-20, 90-10, and different clients prefer different risk levels. So we can sort of customize those portfolios to different clients' risk levels. That makes a lot of sense. It's funny. I work in the real estate industry now, and it sounds like that conversation you have with the designer when you first meet with them. You're like, I want really nice furniture in my house. They're like, cool. I'm going to ask you two questions. One, how much do you think is the right amount to spend on a chair? And two, how are you going to feel when your kid gets ketchup on this couch? And the answer to those two questions helps you triangulate the entire (laughs) design. That's so funny because we just redecorated the kids' rooms like over COVID (laughs) and- the bills we'd get from our decorator oh. are shocking. We just and, and now some of those yeah. have ketchup on them, and it's yeah. so frustrating. It's like, how can that be? Yeah, we just after seventeen years left New York City, moved to Boston, and we just had to furnish because we were going from a two bedroom with, by the way, three kids, but into a five bedroom. So we need to decorate everything. We just got all of our furniture and we did a lot of white and people come in and they're just like, you're brave. You're <laughs> Bad idea. Yeah, you knew your risk tolerance. So with you white. With, exactly. With white I'm furniture, willing to. I'm white okay. Is the, uh, right. is the naked short. <laughs> Harry, I want to touch a little bit on the coding and the model building that you were talking about a little bit. I don't know if you've yeah. heard this expression before. Have you ever seen the acronym TLDR? Maybe your daughters have seen it. It's I too long, know. didn't read. Uh, And so basically when I write my emails and I write five paragraphs at the top, I write TLDR, you know, I need you to swing by and fix my gate or whatever it is on Friday. It sounds like in essence, that's what these models are doing, taking massive amounts of things that you could not possibly efficiently spend your time listening to reading and pulling out the salient data points and then taking those and forming them into cogent investment theses. Can you talk to us about what that looks like now in the world of AI being so top of mind for people in a world yeah. where you spoke to the increased automation of people in sales and trading roles and the human intellect and all of that. And how do you weed out noise versus signal? That's because yeah. you don't have that human overlay in the initial data filtering process. Yeah. All right. So there's so much to what you I know, just sorry. asked. Yeah, if I don't answer part of it, just remind me because it's You're such fine. a great question. Why do you need to do analytics at all? And it starts with intuition. So when you trade, when you look at markets, you build up an intuition, which is, I think, our own brain's way of kind of wiring themselves in response to the experiences that we've had. My answer to people who say, look, I have an intuitive feel for markets. I don't need analytics is write down your intuition. So you have an intuition, you feel stocks are a good buy, that's your gut feel, but Mm -hmm. just write it down. What are the reasons that you think so? And invariably people, well, usually they just tell me, go away, I'm not going to do that. Sometimes (laughs) they actually try to, to say the reasons. And what invariably you find is that people have a very, very limited outlook on their intuition. Like they'll say, okay, well, valuations are low and... The Fed may cut rates. That's sort of the logic. And so I like it. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. But then when you think about the complexity of the world, you realize, well, besides those two factors, there must be like 10 other things that impact what stocks might do over the next month to year to five years. Mm -hmm. And that's really outside the scope of anyone's intuition. None of our intuition is going to Mm -hmm. capture 10 different factors. Mm -hmm. So at that point, you need the models to help. You need the models to basically codify the intuition to be able to say, okay, you have these five different influences that typically matter for forecasting this asset class. One or two of them are pretty bullish. The other one is a little bit bearish. And the net effect is it's okay, but it's not great, right? Mm -hmm. So the models allow you to take what is intuitive and actually force you to write it down and force you to take into account all of the possible influences. So that's basic analytical approach to finance. Now, how have all of the tools that you mentioned begun to transform that process? Mm -hmm. So I would say there have been three things that have happened over the last several decades that have really revolutionized the way quantitative investing, and I would even just drop the word quantitative and just the way investing works. 
-hmm. So one of them is the availability of data, right? Mm -hmm. So 30 years ago, you could listen to a call, maybe it was transcribed in a piece of paper, but it was very hard for machines to understand what was said on that call. Nowadays, that's an off-the-shelf service you can get from multiple people. So It's almost the opposite. The amount, I feel like it's yeah. easier for the machines to understand them than the humans at a certain point. Right. <laughs> and we are bombarded by information, but now we're capturing more and more of that information in a machine-readable way. So mm-hmm. it, it's both in text and then people are analyzing videos and people are looking at satellite imagery and people are looking at real-time consumer surveys and just any piece of data that can be quantified Mm -hmm. People are capturing that piece of data and thinking about how can we use it. So there's been exponential growth in data. That's one of the legs of the stool. Mm -hmm. The other one is computation has gotten really cheap, right? And it's been amazing how quickly it's become cheap and how cheap it's become. My iPhone has the computational power of a supercomputer from 30 or 40 years ago, and it costs almost nothing, (laughs) relatively speaking, right? So, So we have the data And we have the hardware to analyze the data. So that's been really important. The third part of it, which has been maybe overlooked by people who aren't experts in the space or who don't spend all their time coding, but which might arguably be even more important than the other two, is open source software. Mm. So if you've heard of... Sure. So in the past, like when I was doing my dissertation, I did it in a computing language called MATLAB. And MATLAB is a, it's a private company and they Uh they have a clever business model. They make the tool available for free to students. And then when you work, you have to pay for it, which is okay. And when I needed to write a piece of code, I did it from scratch. If I needed to write some piece of analytics that did something, I found a book, I would open to page 372. It would show me the algorithm. I'd say, okay, I type it in. And that's how progress would go. At some point over the last 20 years, All of that changed. And it has been absolutely transformational to science, not just to quantitative investing, just to science overall. What happened was people figured out that we can share code across many people all around the world using code repositories. One of them is called GitHub. There's like GitLab. So effectively, it's like a website where you can take code you have on your local computer, put it on that website. Any change you make to your code, it keeps track of it. And it allows me to work on that piece of code together with a hundred other people who can be all over the world. Like Google Docs. This is all brand new information to me, by the way. I know nothing about that. Like Google Docs, exactly Google Docs for code. It's amazing. So what ended up happening, going back to the MATLAB example, MATLAB to a large extent became, it's not obsolete, it exists and it still does some things well, but it got replaced by things like Python and R, which are at their core free. Mm. It's like a totally different thing. It's like MATLAB used to cost thousands of dollars for each user license when we had it at Morgan Stanley. Python is free and R is free, which is another programming language. Mm -hmm. And the way that those things get updated and maintained is by a group of volunteers using these open... Exactly like Wikipedia. Exactly. So Python is maintained in the same way that Wikipedia is maintained. There are (laughs) developers who volunteer their time you have a developer base of tens of thousands of people all over the world who go and use these tools like GitHub to collaborate with each other, to keep track of the changes they make to the code, to make sure they don't break the code. Because if you do a change and it doesn't work, you can go back to the way it was before the change happened. Uh-huh. And so it's this huge humanity-wide collaboration so to build cool. these tools. And so it's had two effects. First of all, instead of paying for MATLAB, Python is free. Second of all, That algorithm that I spent a day and a half typing in from page 372 of my (laughs) book already exists as a package in Python or R that someone implemented, documented, tested, and is maintaining and improving on an ongoing basis. So our ability to use the fancy computational power to interact with the massive data sets is only possible because of this open source coding ecosystem. And this coding ecosystem has allowed us to do in a day what used to take literally a month. And And, and this is... I had no idea about any of this. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's absolutely amazing, the process. And you can go and look up, for example, the user count on GitHub, how many people are using it. It's Uh exponentially growing. I think it's now like the hundreds of millions of people. And none of this is to say anything about AI. This is entirely before AI. 
And yeah. one dumb so, question. Yeah. Are most of these people who are doing the coding, are these people who have like studied it or are these people who have like figured it out themselves? This is everyone. So I went to Brown and I study computer science and it was a popular major at the time, but it was like mm -hmm. a geeky major. I was so, an engineer at Brown, but the computer science. I started off as an engineer actually. And then I thought that this is too hard. I'm going to do computer science. No, that was actually my exact thought. I get the uh, alumni magazine from the computer science department. Then mm -hmm. they recently wrote that the most popular undergrad course at Brown is, is a Python coding course That's for crazy. liberal arts. That's and crazy. And their coding like assignments yeah. are analyze this classic piece of literature using wow. natural language processing and you mean I everyone could have wants to study my it. paper on the brothers karamazov and just done open source coding for it oh, i guess this is like having chat gpt like write well, all your essays for you this is a big problem now for us at yeah. columbia and actually in all mm -hmm. of education because you can exactly do that using chat gpt which is a whole other thing. Like, how do you guard against it? But yeah. so to answer the original question is anyone can code. And so you have people yeah. who have PhDs in computer science or PhD in stats who've like done that in their entire life to other people who just picked it up mm -hmm. and realized, look, if I learn how to do Python coding, I'm just going to be better at my job than right. I would be if I didn't know how to do it. In fact, I think our most popular MBA elective at Columbia Business School is also Python coding right now. That's so interesting. And it's been a revolution. And none of this is, this is all before AI. Yeah. AI is like a whole additional layer to this because what AI allows you to do is to ask the computer to write brand new code that hasn't been written yet automatically. So it went from, I had to write the code in MATLAB to the code has already probably been written by someone tested and maintained, and I can just use it mm -hmm. off the shelf for free Perfect. in one of these open source packages to now, even if the code hasn't been written yet, you can ask ChatGPT or BARD or you know one of these large language yep. models, BARD is Google's version, yep. write this code for me. Mm -hmm. And it writes, you know, I've done this actually, I use it a little bit in my own work. It's pretty buggy code. It, I can't say you wouldn't want to fly in an airplane yeah. Yeah. This control system was entirely oh, written God. by ChatGPT at this point. I was going to say, it's like asking it to write a letter. My husband actually had to write some recommendation letters for his like golf course when he used to live in New York and he would like spit in information and ChatGPT would spit out the letter. And again, right. it needed a lot of work, but it was a good exactly. base. Get an outline. So that's, yeah. outline. that's exactly the right analogy. It gives you a good base. And you go in and you modify it and you make it work out. It gets it 70% right, and but that saves you hours and hours of work. And with time passing, the 70% will become 80%. I don't think it'll ever become 100%, but it'll be 80%, it'll be 90%. Like these things will get better. Yeah. But the tools are already amazing. So this is like a whole new ingredient that's been added into the mix of now the code can write itself, which is mm. really revolutionary as well. So, so all of these things have combined to really transform how people should do investing. And that's one of our sales pitches at Quant Street is, you know, like the world has changed as your portfolio. Ooh, and I think for a lot line. of people have not changed how they invest. Actually, remarkably many people, especially investment advisor space, there's still this feeling that like you have to do it the old fashioned way, which is human beings having an intuitive feel. And that certainly plays a big role. And it even plays a big role with analytics. You still need human intuition. But why aren't you taking advantage of the ability to digest these massive mm -hmm. data sets that you could never on your own go through all that information? Why aren't you using these tools mm -hmm. to improve your process? Do what you do well, but use these as a tool to augment what you do. And I think it's happening. It's happening really in a lot of places, but it hasn't fully happened. Mm -hmm. But the industry will continue to transition in that direction. Now, one of the things that I'm curious about in terms of the practical application then of these kind of models is how do you take into account something like the last three years? When you look at the last three years, what is normal? We've been in the aftermath and recovery from all time extremes. If you like squint, you can kind of see the current economic environment kind of rhyming with the late 70s. But when you plug mm -hmm. all of this into a model to say, okay, what's the trend line? Where should we be going? What does mean reversion look like? How do you then weight something like 2020, 2021, these right. crazy data points? So this is a great question. Clearly, you're someone who's done a lot of work in markets because that's exactly <laughs> the right question. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. So to give an example, last year, sort of at the depth of the market sell off in 2022, our forecasting model with all the ingredients that go into it basically said, okay, you should be 100% in cash. Mm. It said, I hate everything. <laughs> 
everything is a disaster. Um, How do you really feel? Just go to cash. Uh-huh. And at that point, you have to sort of look at the model and think to yourself, wait a second, let's take a step back and try to understand what's going on in the world. Mm-hmm. We had this big inflation spike in the back of supply chain disruptions, people returning back to like a service-based economy, the tragedy that's happening in Ukraine, all these things sort mm-hmm. of came together. But you could see a path out of it as well. Mm-hmm. You could see that the supply chain will normalize and right. the service economy will reawaken and people will find jobs and where there are openings, they'll hire people. And right now, models can't think at that level of abstraction. They just cannot yeah. do it. They can look at statistical regularities, but the regularities have to be there in the data for them to find. And so when you have very disruptive episodes, the models really screw it up. Anyone who tells you otherwise isn't being honest. That's a, but they I just, love hearing that because yeah. that's what well, you always wonder. So when I did my trading job, mm-hmm. Morgan Stanley Old Lane City, we had a lot of quant models and we would find trades using our models. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that for every 20 signals our models identified, 19 were garbage. Really? Like total garbage. Wow. Absolutely. Wow. Why? Because it would be the sort of thing, there's a company, it has a corporate bond, and the bond widens out from like 100 over live or a spread of 100 basis so points now. to a riskless interest rate, <laughs> so far, <laughs> to trading at 400 over. And your model doesn't know why. It says, this is a great buy. You should go <laughs> buy this credit. And then you call up an analyst and you say, what's going on? And they say, well, you know, there's a rumor that KKR is going to buy this firm using a lot of leverage, like LBO, this firm. And then it's obvious that you're not going to go long this credit. And it's obvious that the model has no idea about this. Right. And that's sort of how I grew up in the quant world, where the model was wrong 95% of the time. You grew up as a quant, not trusting the model. I love that. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But the 5% that it was right, it was really right. Because Mm. there was that gem in the garbage (laughs) that was really a mispricing the people just hadn't noticed. And you had to go through 19 pieces of garbage before you got there. But then when you get there, the value of the model was to identify those gems that would otherwise have been impossible to find. And I very much learned from practical experience the limitation of models. Now, now going to today, the same model wouldn't make that mistake anymore because back then we had no way of telling it there was a rumor about an LBO for this company. Oh, yeah. Now with news data and they can parse Twitter feeds and LinkedIn and earnings calls, it might actually know that there's an LBO rumor. And so the model is going to get better because it has information now that it didn't have before. But getting back to sort of our macro data always better, right? I mean, because it's also getting more bad data. It's getting more bad data. So that's a really great question too. So going back to the macro question, models at inflection points systematically make mistakes because to understand what happens at an inflection point, You can't rely on statistical regularities. You need to use an abstract layer of knowledge that models do not have, Mm -hmm. that AI doesn't have either. Like AI right now, and I've studied a lot about how these large language models work, are amazing, amazing tools for guessing what word should follow a bunch of prior words. Oh, I They're see really all the time when we're writing. It drives yeah. me nuts. They don't understand anything, except they know that given the five words you just said, the next word is likely to be coffee. It has no idea what coffee is. It doesn't know that coffee is a drink, that it has caffeine. It has none of that knowledge, but it knows that the word coffee is likely to follow these words. So that abstract thinking that you need to understand what's happening in the world at inflection points, models just don't have. Right. What they're really good at doing is when you are in the steady state of a regime or relative steady state to identify little, call it, I don't know, mispricings, risk premium opportunities that arise because of institutional frictions, because of some institution has to trade a big position. It takes them a long time. There's price impact or institutions because they have to manage everything by committee, can't respond quickly enough. So the model is really good at identifying those sorts of things, but it's very bad at identifying inflection points. And Mm. now the other thing you said, which is a great point, is the data can break the model. Too much data, not enough time. What do you do with all of it? Mm -hmm. So there is some help here. What people call machine learning, the way I would differentiate machine learning from econometrics, Mm -hmm. even though they're sort of the same thing, is machine learning really focuses on how do you throw out bad data points. So the big question in machine learning is how do you choose 25 different potential forecasting variables 
and select from those four good ones. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's like the heart of the matter. So a lot yeah. of the analytics that we have at Quant Street use exactly those techniques wow. of we want to forecast the return of non-US developed country stocks. Okay, mm -hmm. fine. We have 25 variables that we can throw at, at that problem. We understand 22 might be useless, but which three are working? And so that's what the models try to figure out. They basically put in the different variables as forecasters. They see, do they help? And if they don't really, really help, they just don't put them into the model. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a lot of statistical approaches or whatever, machine learning, that try to throw out the bad, not useful data and not overfit the model to the data and actually figure out what data is sufficiently useful that it should go into the model. So that is very much an area that people have been working on for many, many years and that practitioners use to address that problem. With regard to AI, for reasons people don't fully understand, and it's literally like an open research question that I was just reading about like a week ago, those models do really, really well with complexity. And for reasons people just don't understand, because it's the opposite with the prior generation of models. Uh -huh. So you can somehow throw gargantuan amounts of data at these neural networks, uh -huh. and they sort of figure out which data do we need, which data do we not need? And then whatever they figure out kind of generalizes to looking at the future as a forecasting tool. Again, for reasons people don't fully understand. That, that's a little that's scary. scary. Yeah. 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 yeah, the model's it, really it's, good it's a little we scary. don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a lot of that in these large language models of they're really good at stuff and people don't really know why. The complexity of these models is so massive. Now. You know, They have like hundreds of millions to billions of parameters that people don't really know like oh, where in the, the model... <laughs> <laughs> is the circuit governing this particular decision? Where is it? They're not sure. Wow. The same in our brain. Like people don't totally know which part of our brain makes what decisions. It's getting to the point with some of these models where people don't really know like what part of the model is making the decision. <laughs> but the models are really good at generalizing and you can train them in a way that makes them better at generalizing, which people also do. So, mm -hmm. it, so what you mentioned is like a first order concern for us as well. We sometimes throw in a new variable and it makes a model work more poorly and then we just have to take the variable out. So it. it's very much a first order the model, like especially within your firm. How much tinkering is going on? So I would say there is light tinkering and heavy tinkering. Uh -huh. The light tinkering we do all the time. And the kind of tinkering you do. So our signal really consists of these two components. One is, I would say, like a trend component, like the same way. I'm sure you've talked to people about momentum effects, just kind of like a trend effect in asset classes. And the other one is the output of our machine learning forecasting model. Uh -huh. So the light tinkering you can do is to decide how much of those two signals are you going to pay attention to. Yep. Are you paying more attention to trend or more attention to your model? And that's a lever you can play with. On the heavy tinkering side, we also do that. Sometimes you sort of find we have an asset class in here and it just isn't working. For this asset class, we are not giving it enough information to figure it out. So for example, a few months ago, we added a variable to our model, which looks at the rate differential between U.S. debt and German like boon mm -hmm. yields. Boons, yep. Why? Because we were finding that for some dollar-denominated foreign investments, like investing in international bonds or international stocks, the model sort of was missing something about dollar fluctuations mm -hmm. that we found by putting in an interest rate differential between the dollar and foreign currencies was allowing the model to better capture whatever that dynamic. So I would call that like medium tinkering. And on the heavy tinkering side, we've actually been working on replacing our current set of models with a neural network-based model. So that's very heavy tinkering. So we are very actively engaged in refining models, refining the data that we're using, updating the analytics that we're using. But the tinkering really happens all the time, from light to heavy. There's always updating, changing. It's very much a it's dynamic. It's not a static process. model. And you're no, just like, well, the model says. I have a couple of questions. I mean, so you are a professor, right? You are seeing students all the time. Yeah. So for students who are currently looking to go into finance, whether it's the banking route, because they ultimately want to go into PE, whether it's trading, whether it's ultimately want to go to hedge fund. I mean, how important slash like, do you think it is essential that these students have a foundation in coding. I mean, do you see AI changing the landscape in the next 10 years? Like, what's your view on where everything is headed? So that's a great question. I will answer it by an anecdote. So I was talking to one of the major investment banks to the head of their capital markets business. And the person said, we'd like to look at hiring your master's in financial economic students into jobs in our business. And I asked her, you mean like, you know, quant jobs? And she said, no, no, actually not quant jobs. 
what we really are looking for is for people to do the traditional kind of jobs of analyzing issuance. Mm -hmm. But we're finding that people we currently have in those seats don't know enough coding to do the job well. Wow. So what we're hearing from a lot of people, that's just one anecdote, but we hear that from many, many people, is wow. not that they're looking for quants, mm -hmm. but they're looking for people to do traditional financial decision-making jobs using quantitative tools. Mm -hmm. So it's very much becoming, I think, part of the course for the profession. If people want to go into an investing career, mm -hmm. they would be very well served to study coding, at least to the point of understanding what the issues are. Got like it. they don't have to become super duper software engineers, but they need to be able to be conversant in and at least use it for some tasks. That like using so Excel, um, like using Excel a little bit. It's exactly the right analogy. It's mm -hmm. like back in the seventies when people used, I don't know, the abacus or whatever. And someone <laughs> said, oh, I have Excel. And they said, I don't need Excel. I have this electronic calculator. I can do everything on the calculator. Yeah. And at some point they saw that the person right next to them was doing 50 times the amount of work that they were doing mm -hmm. in an hour using Excel. And they said, oh yeah, I should use Excel. I mean, it's exactly the same sort of thing. You can yeah. do 50 times the amount of analysis in Python than you can do using Excel in the same amount of time. And you're just putting yourself at a huge competitive disadvantage to not give yourself that tool, that edge in your career where other people will have it. So to me, that's an absolute no brainer. Yeah. You want to go into finance, you should know this stuff. Wow. I was talking to a person who runs an investment banking group at Morgan Stanley, who said to me, we don't get a lot of investment banking people who know coding, mm -hmm. but he said that should really change because what do we do in the models we built to raise money for companies? We do projections. We yeah. try this scenario, try that scenario, and we do it in these very ad hoc ways of doing it in an Excel spreadsheet. Yes. Why aren't we using very systematic simulation-based approaches to figure out how to value the companies that we're raising money for. granularity. Kristen and I were talking yeah. about this. It's like, oh, where do you get the input for the beta? Well, you look it up on Bloomberg. It's like, okay, haven't we evolved? Like, isn't there much more right. sensitivity to this than we could apply? Because these inputs have so much weight in the model that you're building. Just learning about some of this stuff now from Kristen, I've always wondered these things. And it sounds like the industry is evolving in real time. It's evolving in real time. So I think you're very well served for a young person getting into this business. If you're an econ major, if you're like a we business major, Python, like study coding, you have to at least be conversant. On the AI side, what's amazing about AI is you don't even need to be able to code to do some of the things that you would have needed to code to do in the past. The way, from what I read, I'm not privy to their internal discussions, but Microsoft is currently building in a lot of the chat GPT functionality into their office suite of products. So you can already go on Bard and say, I want to do a PowerPoint presentation. Just write me a PowerPoint that looks like this. It'll already do it. But they're embedding the functionality into Excel, into PowerPoint, into mm -hmm. Word, into Outlook, where you'll be able to effectively automate all these tasks just using AI for yes. which you would have needed coding in the past. So it's possible that AI will allow people to entirely skip the step of coding and just use those tools to make them just more efficient. I don't think it'll entirely replace knowing how to code. It certainly hasn't yet. On the AI side, what I would tell people is, look, you don't have to know it, but you're going to be competing against people who are using BARD, who are using ChatGPT to help make better decisions. I mean, you might be smarter than them with ChatGPT, but if you're not, mm -hmm. then you're going to be at a huge disadvantage, right? So I think where we are is ChatGPT cannot beat a human, but a human with ChatGPT can beat another human. <laughs> That's and if you it. want to do some of these jobs, I think you need to learn those techniques to just make yourself better at what you do. No, that makes um, complete sense. So talking about the skill set for young people coming up into the industry, what is the path for someone who says, hey, what you're talking about is so fascinating. What does that path look like these days? A common pathway to get into these kind of jobs is to get a quantitative master's degree. So to a large extent, when I was teaching at Yale in 2000, when I was TA in courses at MIT in like 98, we had a lot of our MBAs were going into sales and trading jobs. Mm -hmm. So virtually no MBA is going to sales and trading jobs anymore. The people who want right. to go into those jobs now get these quant finance master's degrees. So that's become a big pipeline into this industry is you're an econ undergrad, you're engineering undergrad, some kind of quantitative field, and then you get a master's degree for a year or two. You sort of refine your skills you learn coding even better, you learn the finance, the econ side of things even better. And then using the relationships of programs like ours have with employers, they come recruit with us and we help you connect to people and then they hire you. 
So, so, so I straight think straight out you're... of academia, which is a big differentiator between kind of the more traditional hiring path, which is, hey, if you're a junior and you're curious and you're you got some moxie, come try it out on the trading floor for a while and see if you can hang. That probably still happens to some extent. I mean, I think that happens on the investment banking side. So it I does. think investment it, bankers it does. do a ton of undergrad recruiting. I think for some of the quant positions, we There's don't no hear question. as much they do undergrad. Like yeah. they really look for a master's degree or a PhD, but you don't need a PhD actually at all. That I've said to many people. If you want to go to industry and do quant work, you do not need a PhD, but you might need a master's degree. Mm-hmm. And not simply to show how smart you are, but to learn the stuff that you need to know to be successful the in this business, because you just need to know a lot of things. The skill set is advanced. And it yeah. doesn't sound so, like it's so much of an apprenticeship model as some of the other stuff might be. I think it is an apprenticeship model to an extent in the sense uh-huh. of you learn a lot of generic skills. It's like what lawyers say. You go to law school, but you don't learn to be a lawyer until you get hired and they teach you how to be a lawyer, but uh-huh. you learn a lot of the tools. I mean, I think it's kind of the same way. You learn a lot of the tools, but you don't learn how to risk manage a book until you're working with someone who okay. knows how to risk manage a book. You cannot teach that outside of that apprenticeship type relationship. So the tools are complex. You need to learn a lot to know the tools. That's what we can teach at Columbia or our competitor schools. But ultimately, no one in their right mind is going to give our first month grad a lot of money and say, go trade, right? They they shouldn't do that. They're going to have this person learn from existing traders, try to think, how do I do the stuff that they do better using the tools I learned at Columbia? But ultimately, that apprenticeship still really, really matters because it's very hard to teach those skills of how do you actually make money? How do you actually not blow up your portfolio unless you're actually studying under someone who's done? I have a slightly different question, which is a lot of the students that you have then, are they mostly interested in going into sales and trading to be a trader or to a hedge fund, a prop shop, a quant street, like what you're doing? Is that usually what people go to your program are ultimately trying to get to? So a lot of the students come into our program wanting to work only at a hedge fund or at Goldman Sachs because they don't really understand (laughs) the richness of the financial industry. And so one of the things we do early on is we try to tell them what the industry actually looks Mm -hmm. like. And Mm -hmm. practically speaking, who hires our graduates? I would say there's three groups of hiring institutions. The smallest one are hedge funds because they're just the smallest by headcount across all of our employers. So they'll hire our students, but that's the smallest, I would say, a group of people go into hedge funds. And would you say they're typically quant funds yeah, like, specific or like, not necessarily? Know, funds like AQR two or sigma. there's a fund. And exactly. Like DE Shaw to Sigma. Like mm-hmm. those I are the kind of Valiazny, yeah. like, you know, Millennium, like 0.72, like those sorts mm-hmm. of places. But again, they're just not that huge. So they don't hire. I mean, they're huge in a sense, but they don't but hire as many people as like. Vanguard or a BlackRock. Or not a, compared to You don't Vanguard have trillions under management. You only <laughs> Right. It's all, only billions. Only billions. <laughs> only so, it is lowered um, up. Yeah, it is. That's true. So that's a minority. The majority go to two places. One is they go to sell side shops like JP Morgan, Goldman, Morgan Stanley. Mm -hmm. Very few of them go, some do, but very few go into trading jobs. Mm -hmm. Most of them go into what I would call like sales slash research jobs Mm -hmm. or into pure research, like strategy jobs. So we've placed people into groups that do strategy on behalf of clients. So a client will come to them and say, look, I have a portfolio. It's a mix of all, you know, liquid, illiquid. And I want to think through how much exposure should I have to private credit in my portfolio. And so that group will help them think through that. So we place the student into those kinds of groups. We place students into other groups that are on the sales side, but that really do research. They'll like, they'll create strategies for clients that their employer will then implement. So they'll have a client come to them Like, you know, they work, for example, I know with investment advisors will come and say, look, we need a particular type of strategy for a particular group of clients. Help us design this trading strategy. So that's a big group of people who hire our students. And the other big employer is real money. So these are places Mm -hmm. like Alliance Bernstein, BlackRock, Vanguard, PIMCO. All of those places have devoted enormous resources Mm -hmm. to building out their quant capabilities. And again, it's not for quant part of the business, it's for their core businesses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they hire our students to work on how retirees should structure their portfolios. What's a safe withdrawal rate for retirees? Should they withdraw 3%, 3 3.5%? How do you answer that question? You know, how effective are tax loss harvesting strategies? All the way to like, how do you think about asset allocation 
like, you know, all of these target date funds, as an example, yeah. if you are retiring in 2055, you invest in 2055 target date fund, it has a mix of U.S. and international stock and bond exposure. But like, how do you decide in that mix? I mean, you're using right. quantitative tools. So we're placing a lot of people into those groups where, again, they're not really doing quant jobs. They're just yeah. doing traditional finance jobs, making financial decisions using quantitative tools. Yep. No, this is so interesting because, I mean, it's funny. We get so many people that ask us, we were talking about how everyone seems to want private equity and banking because they see that as an exit to private equity. But I mean, I also just think so many people don't understand what this whole other world is that yeah. you're talking about. And this is so interesting. So one of the things I really hope is that for people who are listening, it's not like, oh, you can only get into these few select places out of undergrad, but you can go and it doesn't even have to necessarily be an MBA. Because again, a lot of people think I need to go into an MBA. It's you can get a master's in something that this sounds very like just, I want to go learn this. Stuff. I want to learn Python. You know, it's now. like so you can go I feel like study this. Computer. Yeah, learn these. I mean, and then go to these other types of roles. And to piggyback on that, so much of what attracts people to roles is the promise of this prestige and compensation. So not to be the gross person who asks about money, but how do you quantify the contribution of someone in one of these quant roles or at a quant fund? where we're constantly shifting the balance of how much human oversight there is. What is the path to compensation? So I think there has been a real regime shift that is undergoing but hasn't fully happened from how people used to be compensated 20 or 30 years ago to how people are compensated today. When I worked in the prop business, yeah, what about city we were prop? basically like, compensated. You know, I mean, we were, <laughs> we were compensated <laughs> based on our PNL, effectively. Like yeah, we had, yeah, yeah. You know, you had a base salary, but like in a bad year, you didn't get anything. And in a good mm-hmm. year... You yep. were paid well, but it was entirely based on your PL. And if you joined, when we hired junior people into our group, we sort of decided like our group got its allocation and we would decide how much this person contributed. But it was ultimately all based as a percent of our PL in a given year. Yeah. The way the business has evolved has made that calculus just much harder because mm-hmm. it's not like the portfolio manager who runs a quant fund is really making all the decisions, right? It's not like the person who pilots the airplane built the airplane. A lot mm-hmm, went right. into the airplane before the pilot gets into the front and begins to fly the thing. It's now the same, right? So you're running like a $50 billion quantitative fund and you're making important decisions. You're deciding when is the model giving you really stupid answers for sure. Humans are doing that, but a lot of work went into creating the model, refining the model. So the fee structure is becoming a little bit less maybe incentive-based and a little bit more just like traditional Is how it, like it used to look in other of? businesses. It may be a little bit of a flatter hierarchy in a sense. Like, you know, mm-hmm. it used to be just that you had the, the trader, the hedge fund manager, and that person got all the money and the person who worked for them got whatever, scraps. Like mm-hmm. when you make a lot of these things more systematic, the people who create systematization mm-hmm play first order critical roles. And I think, you know, ultimately compensation reflects that. And also there's been a lot more money is being run at lower fee points. Look, are there still some hedge funds that charge 330, 3% management, 30% incentive, but not many. In in fact, you hear the opposite from a lot of hedge funds. Like, you know, we charge 1% and a 15% incentive fee, not even 220 anymore. So, you know, part of it is just competition. The performance hasn't been as good. And part of it is the algorithms are becoming better and better at, figuring out misvaluations. And so the fee structures are changing. I mean, it's still a very high paid business, obviously, but yeah. it's becoming more like law, like management consulting, like those other high paid businesses, rather than you have one person making eight figure salaries and everyone else six figure. Like I think it's equilibrating where <laughs> there's less dispersion, although there's still massive amounts of dispersion, but in reflection <laughs> of the trends that we're so seeing, hard which because is, you're talking yeah. about such a varied industry right. and you're like, except yeah, for this a, one guy. But then yeah. everybody. Right. But then Except for the people who make yeah. <laughs> 500 million a year. Yeah. That's, exactly. Yeah. Right. yeah. Any final words of advice that you would have for someone who is starting their careers? Yeah. What do you what wish you- you'd known when you were starting out? Two answers to that question. So the first answer, is, especially for someone starting out in an investing job, is to listen to the facts and not only to the facts that support what you already think. Uh And for me, this was like a huge learning curve when I got into the investing side of things, because I spent a lot of my time prior to being, becoming a trader, 
trying to just justify what I already believed. And when mm -hmm. you do that in trading, you don't make any money because right. the facts change all the time. And if all you're doing is saying, I have a trade on, let me find the 10 pieces of information that support my trade without being brutally honest with yourself and saying, my trade makes no sense given the new things that I know, you're not going to make any money. You're not going to make any money, right? That's just, it's, it's a truism of investing. So I would say the first piece of advice is listen to the facts and don't listen only to the facts to support what you already think. And if you can't make that mental leap, you'll never be a successful investor. Like it'll never happen. That's just so good that's the first for life. I, it's true for life overall. Yeah, I think that's true. And the second thing that I didn't really appreciate that I appreciate now more as I age is the importance of knowing people. I kind of got into my job and especially in prop trading, like you sort of sit there, you trade and you don't really worry that much. Like, should I go talk at conferences? Should I talk to other people? But what you find is if you ever want to run your own business, you have to move away from the mindset of I just do my job to I meet people and I convince people that I have value to offer to them. And for me also, that was a hard lesson to learn. I hope I learned it at this point, but Especially in order to make the leap. That's not easy. Oh yeah, it, it's crucial. If you can't sell your message to people, if you can't meet a person. And again, my experience has been, I need to meet 50 people before one person even wants to do anything with us, right? right. So right. how do you meet 50 people? You need people to introduce you to people. So if you ever want to transition from being someone's employee to running your own thing, you need to know people. Like when I was at Morgan Stanley, I hardly ever went to our events and I knew a small number of people from Morgan Stanley, but I didn't really take advantage of that institution to really meet like 200 people who I'm sure are now doing amazing, extraordinary things would be great context to have. So I would give an advice to people who start off working, just like meet people and network. talk network. to them, network. network. Yeah. And in order to really progress in your career, I think that networking angle is just first order. You really need to be able to do that in order to really move up and do the things you want to do when you're old. So those would be the two pieces of advice. I think that's yeah. outstanding. And we get so many questions even today just about what is networking? What does it look like? How do I do it? And it's funny because you're like, what do you mean? You just, you write someone an email, you, you send them a text message, you send them a phone call. But because everyone has become so isolated, people have lost this yeah. skill. And yeah. it's funny because neither of us knew anything about finance. We wouldn't last two seconds in the world of Python and all this fun stuff. We didn't know anything, yeah, you would, yeah. but at the end of the day, I did know, take one. I took a programming oh, class at, at Brown. I think it was in C. <laughs> I took yeah, one well, class. That's, hardcore. From my major. That, yeah, that's hardcore. <laughs> Python is easier than C. Is it really? But we were able well, to build to our know. careers just off of leveraging our network. That was really 90% of it. Right. And um, again, our careers were also relatively short-lived. So go <laughs> <laughs> Well, you have, I mean, I think what you're doing now is going to lead to tons and tons of things. Oh, yeah. I mean, this, oh. I think social media is now like the new gateway into networking. It's a very, in, in very a powerful that, like, tool for sure. It's, it's a very powerful tool. Yeah. And the difference between people who become the future CEOs and people who don't, I don't think it's just intellectual capacity. I think it's it's that networking and that putting yourself out there right. that's really the differentiator between people who really advance and those who don't. No, that's such it's such an important point because I think especially for people who are really smart and really good at school, they're so used to like you study hard and then you get good grades and then you get an A. But in the real world, right. it's more about the networking, the politics, and just being able to communicate well that for the most part is going to get you ahead in your career. I mean, being outstanding at what you do is a necessary condition, but it's not yes. sufficient. Necessary. Ex that's yes. what that's, I would say. That's like you exactly have to do great it. Great way to sum it up. Well, Harry, this was absolutely phenomenal. I have learned so much and I, <laughs> I, we can't thank you enough for sharing your expertise, your experience, your, uh, your insight, your time, and also your yeah. vulnerability and just talking about all these challenges encountered along the way and sharing your successes with us. I think this will hopefully be the first of many chats for us. And Yeah, that'd be great. This was very enjoyable. Thank you so much for listening to The Wall Street Skinny. We are more than just a podcast. So follow us on TikTok and Instagram at The Wall Street Skinny. If you're a visual learner, we have content that will help get you up the curve from valuation to Excel to Bond Fundamentals 101. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where we will be publishing in-depth tutorials on all this and more. 